Hey, good afternoon. Because it's 12.04, that makes it afternoon. So, all right, do you guys uh, you feel like you can keep uh, enjoying your food and I'll, I'll get, get rolling here? And I'm so happy to be here uh, and that you would come to this second thing. I'm a little bit tall, not as tall as, as Pastor Mark, but I'm tall. So, thank you for Grace for fidgeting. Hey, I get to, I get to do something really exciting, and that is uh, just present some of the things that I've discovered through uh, over the last several years. Um, I mentioned, or it was mentioned, that uh, our experience as a church. I want you to imagine we're a 58 year old church. We are first evangelical free church, Tucson, and. Um, you know, we call ourselves uh, Journey Church. We are in a, a very, very um, liberal and gospel-resistant culture. So f- evangelical, they're like, what does that mean? Uh, you, you're the guys that voted for Bush. And so, so along the journey, we uh, call ourselves the Journey. So um, imagine me. Um, I, I meant to, to move down to Tucson for three years and then go church plant. But of course, you know those stories always take twists and turns. It was actually the discovery of my son's disabilities that that really stalled us out, where emotionally we just did not have the emotional energy to go and church plant at that point. It, it Timothy's issues led us lead, led me into three years of heavy grieving. In fact, it was our first year. Um, I, I was there six years under uh, a man named Gus. And uh, I like to say, I I accidentally stayed too long. And so six years later, they voted me in as the next lead pastor. (laughs) And I told Gus at one point, if you do this to me, I swear to you, I'll leave in the first year. And he said, I don't know what you'll do, man of God, but God told me you're next. So the church actually voted me in unanimously. Um, It was a church that that had lots of history. Um, At one point, very institutionalized, um, you know, siloed ministry, every, you know, it's kind of like the book of Judges. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That was our church. Um, We were a very big church in Tucson at one time. Sound familiar? And um, here I am, and and Gus did a great favor. I I describe, he broke up the good old boys club, the power structures, the people that, that fought to control and control the staff, control the pastors. And kind of left me with a blank slate of the good people that were willing to stay the course and left over. Um, Tucson's also a pretty laid back culture. And so um, as a guy that was really, really um, passionate to, to make a difference, not just churching church people, but my vision was to lead the church to reach the non, non-churched people. And yet in Tucson, in our time and place, super difficult super difficult to get the church up and moving and growing. And uh, so here I am um, in my early 40s, didn't mean to stay in Tucson. I'm the lead pastor. Uh, My heart is broken because of the challenges of our youngest son and disability, um, medically fragile, those kinds of things that we're, we're dealing with. And frustrated over a lack of, of a church body flourishing. You know, first thing it, I, I had to do is kind of uh, tourniquet the bleeding. People that were still leaving and um, trying to settle the church down, those kinds of things. Just telling that story. But over the years, looking at the trajectory, we were, we were losing ground year over year for probably the first six years. Financially in, in great turmoil. We were uh, at one point... $50,000 in the red, 90 days past due to our vendors. And this did not go away overnight. There were times when I'd ask um, the business guy, can we keep the lights on for Sunday? And he said, I think I can have a conversation with the electrical company. They'll take a partial payment. We'll keep the lights on for two Sundays. So I go, okay, so I'll finish my sermon and I'll, and I'll think ahead. So I'm just describing to you some of those years. First year that I was a senior pastor, uh, my son had brain surgery at Cle- Cleveland Clinic. And um, just all these things happening at once. Um, I just turned 40 when that happened, or just before I turned 40. Just heavy-duty stuff. And so about 2015 was the year that we said, we need to, to, to really do anything and everything we can to mobilize this church to reach this community. In about 2015 as well is when two ladies started to attend the church, uh, Janet and Janetta, and they were co 
directors of a ministry called Young Life Capernaum. Um, Young Life, my, my wife accepted Jesus through Young Life. Capernaum is the branch that ministers to high school students with disabilities. And now Nick Palermo, the founder, is a, is a dear friend of mine, lives up in San Jose. And we've had him out to our church for a Sunday like this. Um, so that's how I got to know, know Nick. But along the journey of, of discovering, um, it's 2015 that we, we were throwing everything, including the kitchen sink, at church health and church growth and mission. And one of those things was in a ministry that just came to us, and Janet and Janetta just saying, we're looking for a place for our students with disabilities. They're aging out of the system. We need to start a ministry. We've asked several churches. Nobody wants to touch it. Would you guys ever be interested? And I go, how much would it cost? And they said, nothing. I'm like, what? Of course. And so that was a major catalytic moment. And 2016, there were several things that caused this. It was a season, but we grew that year over 26%. Our church brought in over $135,000 more than we expected. And it just began this revitalization moment. And I can't tell you how or when or what. Yes, we were praying. Yes, we had been working hard for years. So you don't know, it was just time. And um, that's all a part of, of our story. And, and you know, that, that momentum didn't stay there. It lasted about three and a half years. Um, God has blessed. Um, I took a six-month sabbatical and COVID hit all at once um, so that I could finish my dissertation. Um, but aftermath, as we rebuild post-COVID, right, like every other church, um, one of the things that absolutely defines us now is our inclusive disability ministry approach. And um, I, I happen to know, and this is anecdotally, but again and again and again I run into this, pastors that think that that will be a negative stigma like too many strange people we're, we, who's going to reach the cool kids right and that's going to be off putting that's a real thing and it's shocking where it actually comes up this led me um, somewhere in these years I, I signed up at Talbot for a doctorate with uh, Dr. Gary McIntosh and Dr. Alan McMahon my um, my doctoral program is actually planting and multiplying healthy churches in North America. So it's a, a church health, church growth, church planting doctorate. But they get you thinking in the first year, what will my project be? And I showed that video to a mega church pastor from Sacramento and he goes, oh man, you have to do that. And so that was the evolution. I actually called Janet and, and Jen, Jenna sent him a text. Would you help me if I decide to do something that is the intersection of disability ministry and church health? And they go, absolutely. So I'm going, I think I'm, I'm golden. I'm, I'm going to, so I had three years to invent this thing and develop this. And um, I'll tell you, I, I, what I got to do is, is um, dive into three churches other than our own. So I had all my experiences and all my takeaways, but you can't generalize that. That's just a case study, right? So what I did is I chose three churches that were known in Arizona or California for more inclusive disability ministry. So um, the definition that I have that I've, that I've mentioned to you, when my, my area, my, my hot topic is ministry to, with, and from those with disabilities. And in the service that I said, you guys are on your way. Just, you got a great, great pastoral couple here with a heart for this. And um, I got, my wife and I got to experience the church and the warmth and the joy and the kindness and the patience. You're, you're golden, you're, you're on your way there. Um, but moving from thinking of disability as having ministries for to being the church, the place where it's like, oh no, it is the kingdom of God party. It is the celebration spoken of in Luke 14. That's my passion. That's, that's where I'm coming from. Ministry to, with, and from those with disabilities. Amos Young is a Pentecostal Asian guy. He's a professor at Fuller here in Southern California. Um, raised in a, in a pastor's family. Um, I forget what, what uh, country that they... Uh, they migrated from, but he's got a, a brother that has Down syndrome. 
So he's very, very passionate about this area, one of the most outspoken. And he says, the goal cannot just be to minister to such people as objects of care, concern, or charity. Although such ministry is precious, precisely what is needed in many cases, the goal must be full inclusion of all and the reception of each contribution resulting in the enrichment and edification of others. So that's Amos, and that's, that's what I mean when we're talking about inclusive disability ministry. Um, one more thing that I'd, I'd like to just mention before I jump into a, a little bit of a flyover of a couple of my chapters, but then really, really give you what, what did I find at these churches? Um, I wanted to talk to you about the state of the church in North America. Again and again and again, the statistics are staggering. Okay, the statistics meaning um, less, say only 20%, this is pre-COVID, so this has radically changed, it's gotten much worse. Pre-COVID, only 20% of churches were growing. Most of them by transfer growth, meaning no new converts are being added to the kingdom of God. They're just shuffling around to the next cool thing, the next better thing but a grave lack of people actually coming in to the kingdom of God. Um, I believe it's, uh, it was uh, George Hunter, 80% of churches are stagnant or declining. Of the 20% that are growing, 19 out of 20 are growing primarily by transfer growth. Um, 19 out of 20 are growing primarily by transfer growth, not conversion. Less than 1% of all churches, less than 1% of all churches in North America grow substantially from conversion growth. So they have a few baptisms now and again, but saying this is actually, they're actually growing. This church is reaching their community for Christ. So it's all these factors, all these crises. There's this gospel receptive people group that are open if we can open, open our hearts and open our doors. But what, what? There's a stigma out there in a lot of church planters and pastors that, that are saying no. Janet and Janetta got turned down multiple times. Churches that just didn't want this to be their thing. And, and so the question is, well, what, what about those churches that do this? And so, again, I got to do a deep dive, three very different churches. And um, when you write a dissertation... You'll see this even in the, in the secular world. Mine, mine had, had a section on biblical and theological foundations. And I'm not going to go deep into this. I'm just going to tell you, I, I was given the privilege after about 11 years of nonstop pastoring. I was given the a, just extraordinary gift of six months to do research and study and write. And I'll tell you, what, during that time... Um, whether it was the introduction, studying the churches, or even just studying the scriptures. I'm going to tell you it was like, it was like um, as close to inspired as you, could, as you could be, where you're reading this in the scripture and going, why don't we see this? Why don't we just read the book? Just overwhelming, day after day, unpacking the scriptures and just overwhelm with what's already in there. So I put a couple things up there, and you know, I could, I could talk about um, the Imago Dei. Um, you could talk about original sin and how it pertains to disability, uh, the story of Mephibosheth, and the picture of God in there. Um, the Good Samaritan, that guy was disabled. Um, the idea of power and weakness, or strength and weakness, the man born blind, Luke 14, and that I just preached out of. Um, indispensable members of the body, like uh, Pastor Mark said at, at the end of the service. But just consider some of these individuals. Job, disabled. I mean, ruined physically. Just absolutely destroyed physically. And the story of God in the disabling of Job. Jacob, what happened to Jacob when he wrestled with God? And the angel of the Lord blew his hip out of socket. The scripture says he limped for the rest of his life. And to this day, the Jews don't eat the sinew of the socket of the hip. Like the, the founder, the leader, the, the man who was named, renamed Israel was disabled. Moses, massive speech impediment, 
unbelievable that Yahweh himself takes responsibility. Who, who makes man's uh, mouth able to speak or his ear deaf or, you know, I the Lord. He takes responsibility for his own purposes. And instead of disqualifying Moses, Moses uses it as an excuse. But God basically like, nope, this is how I set you up to be humble. Moses got to say about himself, he was the most humble man that ever lived. <laughs> That's interesting. The Holy Spirit let him say that. Why was he humble? Man, uh, sin, brokenness, speech impediments. Um, so Job, the oldest book in the Bible, we think, is Job. Disability, Jacob. Disability, Moses. Disability, Paul. Multiple times, thorn in the flesh. Um, eye disease, perhaps. Could have been Malta fever. For some reason, he was, was detained by a sickness long enough to evangelize um, the churches in Galatia or, you know, Paul, the, uh, he was so banged up that the number of times that he was abused, sick, uh, stoned to death and actually climbed out from beneath the rocks. He took a physician with him named Luke. Why? Can you imagine how, how dinged up his, his physical body would be? And then add, I mean, eye disease, um, Galatians, when he says, from now on, let no man cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. What were the brand marks? Scars, 39 lashes. This guy was probably pretty crippled up. And then talks about weakness, then talks about thorn in the flesh. I think Paul was very well acquainted with physical disability. Okay? And then, one last one. The ultimate disabling on record is Jesus the Christ. God of very God. Infinite in power and ability. And just in Philippians 2, the incarnation, God giving up the independent exercise of his divine attributes in becoming flesh. And then it goes further in the condescension, being put to death, disabling. Death is the ultimate disabler. And yet it was in the incarnation and the atonement, the most extreme disabling that we see. And we're told in Isaiah 53, by his stripes, we are healed. It was through disability that the atonement happens for anyone. And so is it because Jesus is so keenly aware of, of disability that makes his heart so, he loves everyone. But in the words of, I think, John Swinton, he says, he seems to take people on the margins and places them in the center of his divine love. That there's something very near and dear to the heart of the Lord when it comes to disability and marginalization that comes through, through that, the challenges and the struggles. Well, um, moving on from there, um, this is fascinating, and then I'll, I'll get to, um, I'll spend a little more time on this maybe, but... It's a fascinating thing, and I think Johnny and Friends has actually done a little piece on this, um, talking about the maturing of, of churches or ministries concerning disability, that they seem to move from compassion and, and outreach and serving, this altruistic, we're good people, we're giving something, and the ultimate expression would be friendship, that we actually choose you as our friend. You, you are like us, and, and we want to just be friends, not just a church doing ministry to them. But what we see is, is this is actually the arc of church history. So in chapter 3 of my dissertation, um, very long chapter, but a deep, deep dive on um, the literature. And really what it becomes is the historical development of disability ministry in the church. And it happens in this order. Now I will say that as early as the first century, some of these beautiful things later on were present. But there are chapters in the history of the church that, that actually match this rhythm. Okay, so the first is that Christians, first century Christians, instantly understood the Imago Dei. No matter who you are, if you are a human being, no matter how damaged your body or your brain, you are an image bearer. Uh, charity and compassion, you see this in the Cappadocian Fathers, um, Basil the Great, 
Gregory Nizani, Nizanzias and Gregory Nissa. Um, those are the Cappadocian fathers. They were huge into philanthropy. Um, the hospital system came from Basil the Great. Charity, modern day charity came out of these guys. And you see that there's fourth, third, fourth century, this charity and compassion, inclusion and belonging. We see that coming, um, Martin Luther. Martin Luther, um, he, there's a quote, he, he did something, he said something terrible about an individual. He thought that they were devil, like a devil possessed person. That shows up in people that, you know, want to criticize Christianity and Martin Luther. However, Luther was a, uh, a minister who, who believed in serving those with disabilities, the Eucharist. And apparently there was a practice amongst priests to serve unsanctified or blessed Eucharist to those with disabilities so as not to dishonor the Lord's table. And Luther was furious about that. He goes, no, if they're, if they're Christians and they don't resist it and they want it, you feed them the real thing. So there's these illustrations, these examples of, of inclusion, belonging. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer would be in there. Reciprocity is a little more modern where the whole idea that they, they bring gifts. They bring gifts. Um, and then church health is really quite new of like, oh, your church is sick without them. And one of the reasons why you're in decline and you're not healthy is you believe in this stigma and you're not doing what Jesus said to do. And when you do do that, there's a great sense of joy. And I'm going to go into that and what I discovered at these churches. There are many church health benefits that come. So I unpacked this just a few, um, few breaking these out even further. Fascinating what Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato they fully embraced eugenics, abortion, and the murder of individuals with disabilities. So Aristotle's words, as for the exposure and nurture of infants, let there be a law against nourishing those that are deformed. They're a drain on society. This is ancient Greece. This is what ancient Christians were up against. But um, one of my favorite uh, resources. Do you ever heard, heard of the, the didache? It means doctrine. In first century Christians, um, Jews, wanted to help their non-Jewish brethren understand the law of God. So they wrote the didache um, from Hebrew, Aramaic, into Greek, explaining, and then they added some commentary to it. And as early as the first century didache, they basically said, I have it in my paper, I don't have a quote up here, but basically forbidding any and all forms of, of abortion. So pro-life was, is ancient. That, that life begins at conception, including those with deformities. And ancient Christians, first century Christians, stepped up and says, we will adopt all of your deformed children. Quite often people would have a child and you go, whoa, um, they'd call them monstra and, or, and they considered them portents, meaning curses of the gods and they would take the child and leave them out to be exposed and die or they'd leave them, leave them in the town square for someone to pick them up and raise for a slave and the Christian said, no, time out, stop, stop, first century, imago Dei. And that's what I found. So it was, I mean, just kind of a holy, amazing, um, blessed, inspired time of going deep with that. Um, charity and compassion. Love George Hunter's quote. He's uh, getting pretty old now. Um, he was a guest professor, but he says, the very earliest Christian movement began this way. Jesus of Nazareth engaged a range of people that included lepers and people who are blind, deaf, possessed, mentally ill, as well as prostitutes, tax collectors, Samaritans, Gentiles, and zealots. What did these groups have in common? None of these groups were permitted in the temple. And yet the church said, hey, you can't go to temple? Become a Christian. Join us. And so, and, and again, um, the Cappadocian fathers really took that to new heights. Tim Keller talks about this and the power of mercy. So when we give ourselves away out of compassion, he says mercy has an impact. It melts hearts, it removes objections, it forces 
respect out of even the hostile to the gospel. So I know uh, Southern California isn't um, necessarily known as being uh, a Christian nation, as it were, right? Right? And maybe, maybe this church would get criticized and condemned for, for instance, your stand on abortion um, or recreational marijuana usage, something. And, and they want to say, oh, those uptight Christians want to control us. And man, if we could just, but then they watch the things you do for and with those with disabilities. And I'm going to tell you firsthand experience, people that you'd go, wow, they, they're ultra socially liberal, but we find we have more in common when it comes to uh, taking care of the least of these amongst us. And so people that I know, we're coming from two very different worldviews, agreeing on how we include and love on those with disabilities. Many teachers in the public school system that, that uh, are special ed teachers that are very liberal, and yet they're going to go, if there is a church in our area that is a Jesus church, that's the one because of your commitment to those with disabilities. That happened in history. It happens in real time today. Um, our concrete deeds of love for one another are an apologetic for the validity of the Christian faith. Um, inclusion and belonging, these are just great quotes. Tell you what, I'll send you the slide deck. I, I, I cherry picked some of the best. But um, Bonhoeffer, I got I to read this one. In a Christian community, everything depends on whether each individual is an indispensable link of the chain. Only when even the smallest link is securely interlocked is the chain unbreakable. The elimination of the weak is the death of fellowship. Yeah, and guess, guess who Hitler went after first? He, he murdered hundreds of thousands of those with disabilities before he even got to the Jews. And that's never talked about. He wiped them out of Germany. Reciprocity, Amos Young, again, the goal cannot just be to minister to such people as objects of care concern. Did I already read this one? Although such ministry is what's, yeah, I already read that, didn't I? You want to go back? The second half, the goal must be the full inclusion of all and the reception of each contribution resulting in the enrichment and edification of others. He's just an awesome guy, um, believes in a church that you're trying to become. Um, that they're not just here and we're happy they're here. They're involved, they're serving, they're ministering in their own unique spiritual gifts, what Pastor Mark talked about at the end. And then church health. Amy Young again. How powerfully will the love of God be manifest to the world when it sees the church not only seeking to care for those who are the most vulnerable in their midst, but actually valuing how such people contribute to shaping the very nature of the church as an inclusive and hospitable community. So that's what I found evolving through the ages of the, church, the last 2,000 years of the church. I run into people now. We know that there's an upsurgence around North America for those with disabilities in the church. It's happening. We're like on, on the cusp of this. Individuals that think revival is going to come and that's going to be part of the puzzle. Don't know, but there's talk. God's doing something wonderful, and, and even if that doesn't happen, Jesus told us what to do, right? We do it because it's the right thing to do. We do it because that's where we meet Jesus. Well, here is the core. Here's the heart of um, what I get to share with you today, and, and it's the eight positive and two, and watch this, two negative. I'm doing this. You know what quotes mean when you do this in the air? They're not negative. So-called. This means so-called. Um, so here's the eight positive ones. The deep dive. Three other churches. Hundreds of hours of research, interviews, um, group conversations, looking at church history and documents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so this is my chapter six, corroborating data. And um, first one is positive congregational morale. This is a conglomerate graft right here. See that? And, and this is a, a scale where one is like, this is really bad. Like they don't believe this. And, and 
Uh, seven is really, really, really good. So this is like a couple hundred people from three different churches. And, and these, the things on this list are their overall attitude toward the church, not specifically disability ministry. This is just their morale about the kind of church that they are. And so growth potential, worship services, small groups, this is their opinion on how our church is um, combined. You can see it's massively skewed over to uh, the, the six, seven, right? These people, and, and I, these were random samplings. Just give me some people to interview, not necessarily ones that are serving in disability ministry. I want a big swath. Um, and these, this was, again, this was an interview. This was a survey. This was a survey portion. So I used multiple prong, multiple tools to try to get a big picture of the church. So that's just about general church programs and health and leadership. And you see the morale there. This is specifically on disability ministry, disability inclusion. So things like impact on the church that our disability ministry has had, shaped our mission, our witness to the community, um, or helped me personally grow in Christ. So there's the conglomerate. And again, you see everything stacked way over to the six and sevens through the roof that these people are going, oh my goodness, this church is so healthy and alive because of because of our disability ministry. And so it's, it's uh, in picture form. I do some interpretation in my paper, but that's all has to do with um, positive congregational morale, how they see themselves. Now, congregational resilience was linked to that. All three of these churches have gone through massive leadership turmoil in the last five years. One church was PCUSA, and you know they went um, so so liberal that they're an affirming denomination. And so this church made a move within the PCUSA at first to be historic Christian orthodoxy, and then they couldn't stay. And it was just a massive event that they became a, a new Presbyterian denomination called ECO, ECO Presbyterian, that they are they have a high view of scripture and historical orthodoxy and they lost 200 people instantly church of 1200 200 people out the door boom um that was a major event in in their life the next church um founding pastor 40 years after the fact um was found out to have a history as a sexual predator and it was all over Arizona News um, had to do in two states, California and Arizona. Elder Board had to gather on a Sunday morning and go, he's not fit to lead our congregation, even though this stuff was already, he thought he was forgiven and thought it was okay. And they had to remove him, and that just produced massive turmoil. Third Church <clears throat> had lived through um, a failed search committee that was made up of the Elder Board and a pastoral candidate, they were years without a lead pastor, pastoral candidate brought forward, the church went, heck no. And so massive trust issues between the elder board, you guys couldn't find a good candidate, you really thought this was a guy, we, no way, that is not our guy, and, and um, that, there were um, ongoing ripples of mistrust, elder, staff, congregation, mistrust going on there. Every single church, I found multiple individuals that said, the reason why I've stayed is because this is the kind of church that does this kind of ministry. They were so convinced that, that none of the other churches in our area follow Christ in this way. And the morale was so good that they would sustain leadership chaos. And so that's what I described as congregational resilience. Congregational transformation. Um, again, every single church in compiling all the data again and again and again and again and again. They say that this has made us better. Our friends with disabilities being present in the church service has made us a better church. Two of the churches use the exact same, same phrase. We were a wealthy country club church. Wealthy, beautiful, put together people. And the other one described themselves as uptight, white collar professionals. And all three of them said, those with disabilities has helped us relax. 
not take ourselves so seriously, be more laid back and authentic and more joyful and expressive in worship. And everyone there goes, I just love our church so much better than before this chapter. Numerical growth. This is stunning. Um, I can make a case that these churches are 15 to 20 percent larger because of the numbers. The, the second church that I studied and researched um, had more examples of, and, and this, this was divergent, so this didn't make it in the list, but I talk about it. The second church, there were so many people that had actually accepted Christ because of disability ministry. And they might not even be involved in disability ministry, but they accepted Christ because of the disability ministry. So there's, there's one, um, he's a worship leader, and 19 of his family members that are at that church because his niece was loved by the church. So she came to church and 20 people came with her over time and many of them getting saved. And so you can look at that and you look at these churches and go, wow, 10% of the congregation are our friends with disabilities, but they bring a mom or a dad or a, a caregiver. And then all these other people go, you know, I, I met people like, yeah, I'm actually a special ed teacher in the community. I don't help out with friendship class, but I wouldn't be here if they didn't have it because that's what I love. And that's what I do. And that's what I see as being important and meaningful. And if there really is a Jesus following church, this would be the one. So you have this, this church growth component upwards of 20% that um, I found in these things. Uh, spiritual growth. This starts to go individual and people actually saying, I am a better Christian because of being around friends with disabilities. Now I will give you a heads up. The ones that grew the most are the ones that are closest to those with disabilities. Bar none. This it happened every time. The closer in proximity of working and volunteering and giving their time, the more transformed they are for Christ. However, people that just go to the church that know about it are transformed for Christ too. Isn't that cool? So even people that aren't involved were grew spiritually. Theological formation, again, this could be individualistic, um, but this came up over and over again. People understand the Imago Dei, image of God. Throughout church history, you have people, and Augustine was awesome. I, I love Augustine. Mm, Augustine, uh, Thomas Aquinas, some, they had some error, I think, not to the level of heresy, they tied the Imago Dei to cognitive ability and expression and relationship. It didn't take into account um, people with severe cognitive disabilities. Okay, at some point they, they, might, they might even, if pressed on it, be more like Peter Singer. Like, yeah, I'm not sure if they're an image bearer because they're not able to, you know, relate and communicate and make decisions. So, so for the cognitively disabled, they, they, they hadn't been pushed on that. So I'm not going to throw them under the bus, but I'm just going to say that over, over history and time and getting up to, to Luther and, and um, Bonhoeffer and, and more time, we, I think we have a better grasp of how to say it, nuance it to say whether or not it is, it is, it is expressed, it is essential that what is, what is born of man is man. What is born of an image bearer is an image bearer, even if they cannot in this lifetime express those things, right? So there's a better definition that now we think more in those terms and are able to say that. But I'll tell you, every single person in interview, we go, oh man, we get it. Fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalm 139, we get it now. Didn't get it. I mean, I just thought, I thought I knew it, but now I know it. Um, grace, patience. Understanding the gospel, faith of a child. You don't have to pass a theology exam to get born again. You don't have to pass a theology exam to get baptized. You just have to believe with a childlike faith. And so these churches understand the Imago Dei better. They understand the gospel better. They understand grace. And they see themselves reflected over and over again. Man, I just, 
I'm just so much better, better to understand my need and how much Jesus loves me in my brokenness. So all these things um, happening in their lives. Community witness, I talked about this a little bit. Um, word gets out. Uh, these churches, I think this, the second church under, maybe the first church understood this the best. Third church didn't even know. And I'm going, oh, trust me, your name has gotten out in this community, okay? But that whole stigma of uptight, Republican, evangelical, conservatives want to get in our bedroom and control what we do with our own bodies and all this like anti, you know, this like, yeah, we're really here to control you. And when the word gets out, whoa, th these are the ones that are throwing the, the prom, whether it's Tim Tebow's Night to Shine or, or uh, some other thing that's just an outreach, come one, come all, we're going to take you, we're, we're going to give resources, we're going to help with rides, and word gets out, this is the kind of church, and they go, man, I gave up on the church, I did read the Sermon on the Mount, haven't seen anyone really live in that, and then I saw this church, and it gets their attention, it destigmatizes the gospel we say we believe, it puts evidence to it, like Tim Keller mentioned, and word gets out that this is, I don't go to church, but if I did, I'd probably go to that church. Why? They love people, even marginalized people, people with disabilities. And, and it's almost like the law of God written on their heart. It's an apologetic for the legitimacy of the gospel. Eric McKitty, there are a few better ways for our church to share the gospel with unbelievers than through a ministry to those with special needs in their families. As they experience your love and care, it will make your witness all the more persuasive. And Lord willing, they will come to believe in Jesus. And we have examples. Now, this is a strange one. People go, oh, it's so expensive, or what would happen, and how much would it cost us? All three churches, and I would add mine into this as well, people give. Some of the churches doesn't cost them barely anything. They're, they're, it's all done volunteer. But even the church that was like, like running the largest, most expensive version, someone gave them a grant, like, like here, here's $500,000, go build it philanthropic like I believe in that do you have anyone in your family with disabilities no but I believe in that that sounds like Jesus and I got money go and do this so all three churches um, when like here's five opportunities to give we're gonna fund all these projects the first one to, to be closed like we got enough disability ministry every time people are like really warm to this I don't know what's going on but you want to want to raise funds like hey we got this project and we're gonna pass the plate um, and, and again, we've experienced this at Journey Church. We have more funds set aside for disability ministry than we know what to sp how to spend it, okay? And then the two negative findings. Ready for these? See the, the quotes? So-called negative, okay? And we, li we live some of this. Disruption. Hey, ever have any disruption in a church service? That's what the, the context. Um, Brian, whoo, making this noise, or Timothy knocking over chairs, or... One time an elder came out of the bathroom. This is early on in the transformation of the culture. He's like, uh, pastor's kid is in there splashing the, 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 the mirror with water. Rah, 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 rah. And it's like, dude, uh, dear friend, he's a good man. And it just, it just looked horrible. You have people, they're snarky. They think we should still be able to control our 20-year-old son with disabilities. Like, sorry, he's still coming up and yanking on old lady's arms. Like, hey, hey, you know, this kind of thing. And it's like, yeah, but... So he's, there's disruption, right? Um, but then add the second one here, discomfort. We're uncomfortable. We don't know how to respond. And every church talked about disruption and discomfort. But I'll tell you, every single time, every single time they came back and said, true, but it's made me and it's made us better Christians, better church. So it was the disruption, the discomfort that produced better disciples, more like Jesus. Isn't that true? You call it spiritual sandpaper. I was really felt out of, out of place, and it's like, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Disciple, you can go, oh, it sounds like you're teaching me really good things. It's the same place where we get the word discipline, and that sounds negative, like I'm getting spanked, or you're running repetitions on the track. You're a disciplined athlete or disciplined pianist. How about a spiritual discipline where you become better in conflict, in crisis, and, and uh, agitation? You become a 
what you get bumped and Jesus comes out next time instead of rah, right? So, so this disruption and discomfort produced better Jesus followers. David Palin, uh, he's a pastor. He says, it doesn't matter. The behavior of some of them may be awkward. Not even that it is disruptive. They are part of the family. Are they not? The church fails to be the family of God when holiness is confused with orderliness. Amen? That's a good quote. Here's our friend. Do you know McKinney? I don't, I don't know. Jeff McNair is a friend of both of ours. Um, he's been at this church. Yeah, I know. So Jeff, Jeff became a friend along this journey, and um, I love this. Must the word of God be shared in a silent room? Does noise in a room indicate a lack of respect for what is being shared? Do the practices that lead us to being, being able to achieve the silent room during worship show a lack of respect for what is being shared? Does sitting still and doing nothing indicate a lack of respect for what is being shared? It could be that our social structure assumptions need to be revisited. And then I'm going to end with this. This might, might be, this is just so good. Um, I forgot that it was in the slide deck. Brian Brock, um, he's over in Scotland, but he's from Colorado, I think. Um, he's my age, our age, a little, little younger than you. Brilliant guy. Highly recommend uh, Wondrously Wounded. <clears throat> but this is just the picture, and, and just one small thing. I mean, it's a 362-page dissertation. Um, that I'll give out if anyone wants a copy. But um, what, what he says here, what he found, quoting an Irish priest, so this is like over the pond, different denomination, different religious tradition, but just even the presence of Jesus and the blessing of Christ. This Irish priest said, whenever we gather with the handicapped, we are in the presence, I think, of many gentle prophets, sons and daughters, called and marked by God for a special mission in life. And because of their handicap, they speak to us every day in the quietness of their lives, if only we would listen. To say no to them, I believe, is to say no to God himself. The end. <laughs> yeah. Any questions that you have? Yeah. Yeah. What's your some kind of a, a church crisis? Yeah, I had six criterion, and I can probably think of four and a half really quickly. Um, they had to all be like evangelical, like Christian. They didn't have to be EFCA, but they all had to be Orthodox, born again Christian, you know, like that. Um, I wanted them to be near enough that I could visit them during COVID. So I was willing to come to Southern California, but probably not to Washington, D.C. Um, I wanted them to all be inclusive, like they would just self-identify as inclusive disability ministry, like we don't only just have a ministry for them. We want them on, on our platform, in our choir, various times, different ways, so they'd be inclusive disability ministry. Um, I wanted them to be different, meaning I didn't want them to all be Southern Baptist and just you know, do that. So I could do one of those or, or one of these. So there's a variety of things that, um, and then I did oh, recommended. So Jeff McNair recommended a few, Amy Jacober, that is a disability, um, theologian and, uh, a few others that I had connections with say, Hey, would you, who, who would you say? So there were six criterion that I used for that. No, that's just something that I, I just stumbled into, stumbled into. One was for a denominational change in, in uh, more liberal Christians that had a lower view of scripture that were there present and then found out, oh, our pastor in, in church actually is not gay affirming, you know, and so they had to change denominations. Uh, the other one was a secret that was buried, and it came out in a police report, and actually it came out in the uh, Modesto B uh, newspaper. It was happened in Modesto, and then it opened up a huge investigation in Scottsdale, and he got let go from the church, and that was just a massive statewide kind of people heard about it all over. And then the other one is just hearing their story and, you know, churches struggle, trust between elder boards, congregations, staff, what's going on, who's making the rules, I don't know if that's a good, and they just weren't together uh, with each, and they're still coming through those years. 
um, having a, not a founding pastor, but a, a long running pastor for like 27 years that was really trusted. And then this was like 10 years after him and, and three, four years without a pastor and then a failed search and then a new guy. And so they, uh, churches struggle. And I found some pretty big struggles. Yeah, because all of them said we're still on mission. And these people, if we don't do it, we're, we're on a sacred mission. There's, it's like when I was doing my dissertation, there's this a sense of sacred calling to do this project that I've never felt in a paper before. I felt it in sermons, but I've never spent six months. Actually, it was 11 and a half months of research, reading, study, and writing. So 11 and a half months on a single project, I've never done that, but there's a sense like this is really important. And I think these churches have that same kind of thing. This is really important. Like a lot of churches are doing a lot of ministry and a lot of good ministry. We're happy about that. Um, but what we're doing is really sacred. Who else is gonna, gonna invite them in and create a culture in the kingdom of God celebration party that this is not this is not a negative stigma this is our calling card and that people just get excited about it want to give money to it they're being changed by it so yeah another question yeah do you have a friendship class what do you have a friendship class okay so we have friends for life that is meets every other thursday night and it grew out of Young Life Capernaum and then something called Capernaum Beyond. And yes, so, and it has morphed from being a little more fun and games to a little more Bible study and mentoring. And um, boy, it morphed again with Zoom. You know, pre-COVID, we were up to 73 adults with disabilities. And so, yeah, Janetta Holt is magnificent, magnificent lady. And she was actually one of those directors that came to me. And um, done an amazing work. And several volunteers, we're in the same place. Like, we always need more. Wish you'd, you'd experiment with this because you'll be changed. So, yeah. You know, one thing that strikes me is kind of a big issue in evangelical communities is real spiritual formation. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it seems like what a beautiful way to make that so real. Yeah. I, I think that's a very important topic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and the cool thing is, is again, those that are changed the most by it are the, the ones that are most involved. However, everyone is being changed and transformed just because they're with us. That's what's cool. Yeah, just, yeah. Anything else? Janetta, yes. Like, like with disabilities? Janet, no. So Janet is actually on staff, and she is our part-time children's director. But what she's and so in but she where she really flies is um, inclusion. And so right now we have Monday, Wednesday, and Friday work crew. And my son Timothy is at the church like four days out of the week for two hours here, two hours there. We have a, a Wednesday morning coffee shop that's open to the community that's run by our friends with disabilities and, and some of their leaders. Work crews going on, things that janitors would do, picking up pens, reorganizing the auditorium, setting up the next meeting. Yeah, there's stuff they need, they need meaningful work. Um, our son happens to, to be in this gap between day programs, so he's done with school. He, he kind of knew. He could, we could have kept him going, but it's like, we got to stop. And yet he's got too much to offer than to just have like glorified babysitting, you know, some of the different things. But he also falls short of internships. And so there's this gap. And so um, our church, we're, we're in a sweet spot right now where Janet and the team having, um, you know, four here, five there, um, 10 on this day and, and doing things where they can actually serve the church, picking up bulletins, picking up, throwing away things, moving, cleaning out closets. Um, our uh, communications and worships, worship director takes him 
to Costco every other week. Um, she is now pregnant. Timmy is the muscles. He's 20 years old. So he does the heavy lifting. And so that's like a fourth thing that they do two hours on Tuesdays as well. So I see Timmy at church all the time. So yeah. Um, Janet, though she's got two little boys, but no disability, it's just on her heart, you know? And she's an expert in that field. So you don't have to have it in your family. Anyone else? Yeah. Disability ministry is something which we're ill-equipped. We don't, we don't, we, we, we refer people to other churches because we're to sick, so. I would say this, there may be churches that are more advanced, have more resources, more volunteers, more programs, and that's great and good and fine, and they should be our partners. But I don't think any church that's following Jesus should say, we don't, we don't want you here. We can't handle you. Now, here's what, what I do say is lower the expectations. Say, hey, we, we don't have a thing where you can drop him off or her off. But, man, we want you here. And we will, we will do life and community. And you and we are, are to be together. And so you don't be nervous about disruptions or um, so we, we can't, we don't know how to, for instance, how, how to change your 40 year old's diaper, because that's a real issue going on right now. And, and we would love to provide that. We would love to. Someday, maybe we will. That's what we're trying for. But right now, we just want you here. And if he needs to be diapered, then one of you is here. And we actually, we did some remodeling. We have a, an ADA bathroom now, in, in addition to men's, women's, and it has like 400 pound rating changing table comes off the wall, mega reinforced wall, we rebuilt it. And so you can put a full blown heavy duty adult up there to change them. Because we're saying, we, we can do this, we did this. And so you can tell them what your limitations are, but to go, no, go to this other church. Um, I don't know that that's good for any church. I think you're gonna miss out on too many good things. And people will self-select. They'll, they'll find their own better church, unfortunately. But just to tell them, we want you here, we're, we, we don't, we're not as developed as others, but man, we want this. We want you. And for some people, that's all they're really looking for. Like, I'll do the heavy lifting. I'll still drive them. But to know that I'm welcomed here and not stigmatized and ostracized or, or uh, get stink eye, you know, turn around like, keep your person quiet. Like, just, no, that's, that's all most people need. So, Yeah. I think when you start to exclude people and say, we can't handle you, you start to say, Jesus, I can't handle you. Yeah. Anything else? 102, yeah. You know, I, that would be best. I'll put you in touch with Janetta and Janet. They're the experts they have trained. Oh, now this is interesting. Our daughter Holly is actually now Tucson Capernaum Young Life director. So it's like it's changed our family, and we've and they're they're all like epicentered at Journey Church now. But they do they do training, and there's national training, and the, and I. I just, defer, that's where I fall out of my, my pay grade and go, no, nah, I want to inspire you toward it. Those are the experts. So Janet and Janetta should come over here if they, you want to, you know. Um, yeah. Anything else? Because at the end, yeah, well, I, I get to pray a blessing on you. So when you're done, I want to bless this church. Okay. okay. I just want to say thanks to, thanks to Jim for coming. Thank you. Jim, Jim and I kind of got to know each other through some virtual groups we were uh -huh. together, right? A, a, a Zoom meeting on leadership and just, and the free, the EFCA has an affinity group 
uh, that we've crossed paths, an affinity group for disabilities where we've crossed paths there a few times as well. But it's just, it's encouraging. Um, and I don't know if you connected the dots or not, but we were actually formerly served in one of the churches that he mm. studied. And uh, just an interesting side, most, but maybe not all of you know this, that our son Logan is on the autism spectrum. And uh, if you see Logan now, you just think, man, that kid's a good drummer. Uh, if you saw him as a six-year-old, you would be thinking, oh my goodness, what's gonna happen to that child? <laughs> yeah. um, but one other unappreciated thing is the blessing of being in a church that values disabilities ministry when you as a parent receive a diagnosis mm. uh, that I'm, I, I never thought, oh my goodness, where should I turn? I thought, I need Jeff McNair's cell number. And I showed up on his doorstep and said, Jeff, you need to help me walk through this. I also saw as a pastor, the idea of spiritual formation. I'm gonna tell one quick story. Um, and you'll hear this again in a sermon sometime. Sometimes it's, I don't know, there's a phrase I use that, you know, I've got this illustration waiting for a sermon. Uh -huh. you know? <laughs> uh, we took our, anything we did with our college ministry, because that's most of what I did there. We always had kids with disabilities with us. And we were on a hike one time. And there was uh, one of the young ladies who, she would do everything with us. She should probably not have done everything with us <laughs> because of just some of her limitations. But I just kind of had the mindset, if you want to come, we'll bring you. And we were on a hike and she really struggled. And we ended up, there were a handful of people that just stayed with her, walked her through. I think she even fell in the water a couple of times. It was just, she had a rough time on the journey. And as we're, as we're walking and I was with the, the you know, the, I wasn't back with her. I was with the front group. And one of the students came up and said, should we just maybe stop having her come on some of these events? Because this would go a lot easier if she wasn't here. And I said, you know, if the goal is to have a quick hike, you're right. But if what the Lord is doing within us is to develop love, joy, peace, patience, patience <laughs> kindness, <laughs> Do you know how that happens? Not by just going on a hike with friends and you hike in and you hike out. But when you're spending time with someone and you're showing love and patience <laughs> and you find joy. Mm -hmm. If this is what the Lord is producing, if these really are the fruit that the Spirit brings about in our life, it's going to happen through partnering with people with disabilities more so than just going on a hike with your friends. And so I, I love what you shared. I, I appreciate it. And I, I, I love our church and I love our heart in this. And I just keep mm -hmm. looking forward to leaning even more heavily into this as we go forward. So I just wanted to thank yeah. you, uh, Jim, for, for everything you shared. Stacy, it was nice getting to know you this weekend. Yeah. I was going to close in prayer, but, but well, I, yeah, I, I want to. I'll, I'll let you. Yeah, this was a blessing. This was just a fun. We, we got over to Malibu yesterday and came in a little early. We got to fly out tonight, but. What a gift, and to impart uh, some blessing to you, not only in just uh, speaking about Luke 14 and then sharing this, but just praying God's blessing on you. I just, my wife just nudged me before I got up and said, no, there's just a really sweet, sweet uh, culture here. Yeah, it's really sweet people, which is like a church revitalization dream. Like what, what could happen here because of just the good, sweet nature of Christ that is sensed here. Okay, but for the Lord to come and just add his blessing, not to make it so big, so fast that you're exhausted, but just life, new life, conversions, baptisms, uh, baby dedications, just all those beautiful things, right? Yeah. Right? So, Father, you, um, I got the sense of just a genuine goodness here, and what a gift it's been here. I just ask, Lord, that in your time and in your way, that you would allow this church to develop its its culture, its um, mission, its ministries, and that, Lord, you would just bless it. Thank you for people who have been here 20, 30 plus years. Thank you for newer people. Thank you, those that you are calling to eternal life in this community. The, the Holy Jesus, you said the Holy Spirit would be in the world, convicting this, the world of sin, judgment, and righteousness. 
you're already at work in this community and that Bridge Church would really be the Bridge Church to uh, bring people to faith in Jesus and that you would just allow them to flourish in every way. Bless them here. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.